Hey guys, it's Fox again from Martial Arts and Philosophy, and today I'm going to discuss with you Kant's moral theory. So, I know last time I said I was going to discuss some epistemology with you, uh, but I'm going to hold off on that until we're done with the objectivist moral theories, for linearity's sake, and for my own sanity. <laughs> so, to begin with, uh, Kant's moral theory is going to rest on the idea that morality is a product of our ability to reason. So he believes that morality stems from reasoning itself. That is, if you act immorally, you are acting irrationally. He argues this based off of two different kinds of imperatives. The first is the hypothetical imperative. A hypothetical imperative is the idea that a certain goal is achieved only when specific actions are taken, and so it would be irrational for you to not take those actions if you want to complete the goal. For example, let's say that I want to get my doctorate in philosophy, and in order to get my doctorate in philosophy, I have to begin with philosophy 101. It would be irrational for me to continue to hold on to the goal of becoming a doctor in philosophy if I refused to take philosophy 101. That would be a hypothetical imperative. That is, the hypothetical imperative is the fact that I must take philosophy 101 if I want to achieve the goal of becoming a doctor in philosophy. Pretty easy, right? However, Kant also believes that there is a second kind of imperative, the categorical imperative. The categorical imperative is a little different. The categorical imperative is not contingent, meaning it does not rely on a specific goal that we have. So for example, this involves cases in morality. So say your mom is dying in the hospital, whether or not um, you have the goal of going to see her, uh, whether or not uh, that benefits you is not an issue here. Um, you are morally obligated to go visit your mom at the hospital um, regardless of any sort of desires or goals. So the categorical imperative stated as a simple sentence is that we must never treat a person merely as a means. That doesn't mean that we can't use people as a means, but we must always also treat them as an end. Sounds pretty rational, right? So why must we follow the categorical imperative? Why is it that we must never treat a person merely as a means? Well, Kant suggests that autonomy is intrinsically valuable. Autonomy is the idea or the ability for us to choose one thing over another. He defines it as our ability to act freely on the basis of reason and independently of our desires. He finds that fact valuable in and of itself. From there he's able to argue that because we're autonomous, we deserve respect. That is, autonomy is intrinsically valuable, so therefore we are intrinsically valuable because we have autonomy, and therefore, in virtue of that fact, we deserve respect. And so thus, we must never treat a person merely as a means. Makes sense. So, from the categorical imperative, Kant is then able to argue two things. One, that in order to treat people as ends, we must strive for self-perfection, that is, treating ourself as an end, and we must strive for self-perfection in order to treat ourselves as ends, because perfecting ourselves is going to help us develop our rational ability, and thereby it's going to help us develop the skills that we need to achieve our goals via our hypothetical imperatives, those desires that we have to achieve a kind of happiness. Second, he argues that we must also care about the happiness of others because we recognize happiness in ourselves as being a kind of intrinsically valuable thing. Uh, we must then support it in others because we've already agreed that we cannot treat people merely as a means, and in order to treat them as ends, we want to support their happiness as well. So we have a moral obligation to do that, generally. So, 
that's Khan's theory in a nutshell. After that, he divulges into virtues, and uh, there's also one very particularly important um, concept that we're not going to talk about here. There is an alternative conception of the categorical imperative known as the kind of universal law conception, um, but I'm not going to go into detail with that here uh, for brevity's sake because that is actually based on the categorical imperative that I discussed here, the fact that we must never treat people merely as a means. So, to assess this, um, why is our value based on autonomy? Uh, can we accept that autonomy is intrinsically valuable, or does that need some kind of further explanation? And what if we had no autonomy? There is a camp of people that believe that we're determined, basically based on laws of physics, to do all of the actions that we do, and that we're not actually autonomous. Like, it's, it's an illusion that we have free choice. If that were the case, would we then be of no value? To me, this is a major problem for Kant's moral theory. I would like to argue that there are two ways out of this problem. Uh, that Kant seems to have put himself in, in placing autonomy as the foundation to his theory. One is that we could find the foundation to be something else, uh, and I would argue that something else might be a conception of happiness, but I'm going to save that argument for later. The other way of getting out of it is just saying that the categorical imperative requires no further justification. The fact that we must never treat people merely as a means is evident has a moral principle. It seems like it would be difficult to argue for a morality in which it was okay to treat people merely as a means. So with this in mind, perhaps we should accept the categorical imperative as a fundamental moral rule, um, showing that we've made some kind of progress in uh, creating an objective ethical theory. However, there are going to be people be people that argue with this idea, known as the utilitarians, which is going to be our discussion for next time. So is autonomy a good foundation for moral theory to stand on? Or perhaps you believe that I, like I do, that uh, the categorical imperative needs some other ground? Or can it stand on its own without further justification, like I offered? Those are some questions that I would love to hear your answers to. And until next time, thank you for watching, please subscribe, and please watch as we continue to dissect moral theories.